Sports here. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Total Pole Sports here. We are live. Uh, got a big special guest today. Uh, MMA fighter, former Lakewood standout, A.D. Palmore, 4-0 in mixed martial arts, four knockouts. Uh, man, it has been so long since we got to chat it up. We got a lot of people here uh, from Lakewood. Uh, that's going to be viewing this. We're going to definitely get to Lakewood in a minute, but uh, let's talk about what's going on with you, what you got going on right now, uh, your next fight, and uh, how can we watch? And, you know, we want to hear about your sponsors. All right. Uh, so to start things off, um, AD to Cyborg Palmer. Uh, I'm currently here in Wichita, Kansas. Um, I just got finished with uh, meeting – uh, getting some last minute recovery at my sponsor over at my cryo uh, when I get my cryotherapy going. Uh, so, as of right now, I'm getting prepared for my fight this Saturday. Uh, it's going to be my fifth MMA fight, which will actually be my 16th time uh, competing since I've started three years ago. And um, just to list my num number of sponsors, I mean, it goes, the list, list can go on. Um, I have Drink Alchemy, which is a, a, a lifestyle drink. Uh, Butler Hemco, which is my actual CBD sponsor. Uh, Optimal Wellness, which is my chiropractic sponsor. Um, I Cryo Wichita West, which is my cryotherapy sponsor. Um, Tank House Float and uh, Myofascial Release is my uh, myofascial <laughs> uh, sponsor. Um, the Arsenal, which is my supplement sponsor. Perfect Plate, which is my meal prep sponsor. Um, JDW and uh, Beyond and, uh, the Design, they're also my uh, one of my clothing sponsors. Uh, Natural Body, which is one of my fitness uh, sponsors. Um, Revolution Lounge, shout out to Revolution Lounge, which is my club sponsor. Uh, uh appreciate those guys. Uh, bail hope bonds. Leaving, hope I'm not leaving the, nobody. How about the bail bonds? Bail, yeah. Uncle Bill's Bell Bonds. Uh, shout out to my my guys over there. Uncle Bill's Bell Bonds, which is my other sponsors, uh, who helped me get the job done with, it, helped me out with you know getting everything that I need and be fight ready and everything like that, and also give me the opportunity to make some money on the side by being a Bell Bondsman and uh, bringing in people who actually need help through advice or even getting them bonded out uh, when it comes down to their loved ones and stuff. So shout out to all those people that sponsor me, who helped me out with getting this fight process as smooth as possible, so I can take care of everything I need to do inside and outside the cage. Yeah, yeah, man. You so see. you got a lot going on, a lot of support. That's pretty awesome. Oh, yeah. So you got uh, a fight coming up Saturday. How long is your training camp for this one? Is it any longer compared to previous ones? Or uh, To be quite honest, I've been in training camp probably since I thought my last fight was September 10th. Um, and uh, we kind of were anticipating uh, some of the other promotions that I fought for that they were going to have some existing dates in the near future. And uh, right after my last knockout, uh, you know, they were really eager to have me back on the show. So, you know, we also talked about potential dates that they had in mind. And so as soon as I, after that fight, I actually uh, took some time off because I was on a nine month wrecking streak of just constantly being in and out of a uh, fight camp. So, um, so what I did was uh, I took like a month off, I, I suppose, and got right back to it in um, December. Um, no, 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 November. So I've been in fight camp since November, really, even before I had got sent the contract or even before they even announced that I could be on the fight card. Um, I just put it upon myself to say that, hey, look, I know I'm going to come back either the end of January or early February. And then, you know, I talked to my, uh, my, my, my managers uh, at the time. And then even when I switched managers, cause now I'm on I'm with KO reps. Shout out to my managers at KO representatives, um, those guys. And I've just been in fight camp ever since, just getting pushing, pushing. You know, so nice. Sounds good. So I got a question as a as a fellow heavyweight. Um, are you right at the upper edge, two sixty five, or are you walking around a little bit heavier and then you're cutting for your fights, or are you kind of in the middle like uh Kane Velasquez, you know, being at the two thirty two forty still fighting those bigger guys? Oh, to be quite honest, uh, I never even check my scale. <laughs> I never really uh, look at scale. I never really make it a, a thing to check the scale. I, I don't really have to worry about cutting weight or having anything like that. I like to be able to. I used to have a vision of being like, oh, I'm gonna fight at a certain weight. Um, I had this thing where you know, early on in my fight career, where I was trying to like, you know, how, where do I feel comfortable at with moving? You know, especially when we playing football, I always felt like I had a sweet. I had to find a sweet spot for being in the trenches, but also still being agile and be able to uh, make those moves on the run. So I try to find a sweet spot. My sweet spot was 245 when I was playing football or 250. 
But as I started to fight, you know, my all of my training regimen and everything like that began to change. So I got into the situation of having to figure out where do I feel comfortable at and um, changing my fight style and, and, uh, and arranging my fight style or towards and gearing it towards how I fight, but also gearing towards what I feel comfortable with doing. So uh, what I ended up just doing was um, just training, 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 and uh, get into a, a, a situ getting myself in a situation where I could just comfortably be able to excel with my fight pace, find out what my fight style was, and adjusting my weight towards that, and then also get into the point where it's like, hey, I don't want to be too light or too heavy. How about I focus on just being able to make sure that I continue to have my my, my gas tank as high as it can be, uh, and then let my weight fall where it needs to fall at, you know. So that's why I really just don't try to take too much into, oh, I need to weigh this much and weigh that much, you know. So yeah, not a bad way of looking at things too. I mean, the more you're training, like. You know, really, I can only imagine, you know, you might check it, you know, a week or two before the fight and see where you're at and if you're close. But if not, then it's like just keep doing what you're doing and focus exactly. on the way, you know, to worry about the, the weight at all. Oh, yeah, for sure. I think I think I've gotten to the point where it's like a, the way I train, I don't really gain a lot of weight, but I also I'm in a good spot where I'm like. I'm never getting really over 265 and then how I train, how I eat, you know, how I diet, how I sleep, all those different things. I've got me into the situation where I can go ahead and not have to worry too much about my weight. So I'm more showing it more so uh, focused on how, uh, how do I feel with what's on me? You know? So if I'm at 250, it was like, oh, okay, you, you feel good at 250, but how did your, how, how does your body feel? How are you moving at 250? You know, like do your legs, are your legs under you, you know, or do you, do you feel like you need a little bit more strength in you? Do you feel like you can, go ahead and get them off the ground over and over and over again, go do a takedown, get up, get up, get up over and over again, you know? So it's more so just about how you feel uh, with the weight. So I'm not, I really don't like to play the weight, the weight game, if that makes sense. Um, but I do like to make sure that I'm, um, I'm in shape enough to be below that 265, but just feel comfortable where I'm at ultimately. Right. And I think that's a great point too. Just you know, the more comfortable you are in the cage, the more comfortable you are in training, um, the less you're thinking about other stuff, like you said, you're not thinking about the weight, you're thinking about what, how are you feeling? What is going on in terms of your body? You know, I've been there for training jujitsu and Muay Thai and stuff. And, you know, some days or some weeks, I would say you feel a lot better than others. If you've got a clean diet and you've been making it to the gym a lot more versus Definitely. you take a two week hiatus, you come back and you're kind of slower. You're not as agile moving around. Yeah. And, and, and that and that's the thing that I feel like, you know, that's best, especially when I came off of uh, like, you know, I went on a, a crazy streak. Um, I was in uh, last year. Um, I kind of wanted to, you know, make my make myself known. So I, I, I took I took on this thing where I was just like training nonstop, like all last year. Um, I actually fought um, November it was my MMA debut, debut. November, I was unranked. You know, um, it was my first time fighting uh, MMA. Um, I fought a whole bunch of smokers, a whole bunch of kickboxing, fight, kickboxing fights. So I just kind of was like had this vendetta where I was going to go out and I was going to compete and I was going to just make as much noise as I could as a as a um, as a fighter. So what I ended up doing was um, I was in fight camp nonstop. I fought November 27th, um, and then I was in that day. My my coach that told me, "Hey, look, you're going to fight on the EFC card. We're just going to be in April." Uh, in April. So I was like, well, if I'm going to find April and I, and I noticed now, you know, I went to this other gym and they were just like, hey, look, all these pros are getting ready for a fight on that same card or around that same date. BKFC, which is bare knuckle uh, uh, boxing. And then other people getting ready for MMA fighting. They were all pros. And they were like, I was in there sparring. They was like, hey, look, you can be training with us for our fight camp. I was like, well, I don't know if I can afford <laughs> that stuff. They're like, no, nah, you're going you to be with us. <laughs> so I was the first time that I was able to train with actual pros, um, and I was training with them, waking up six o'clock, waking up five o'clock in the morning, meeting them at six, running stadiums, um, training with an actual uh, uh, fitness uh, instructor with, you know, we're doing a whole bunch of like uh, cross training, a lot of fitness stuff, a lot of things that was helping me with, you know, my agility also helped me with, you know, rounds and how to be prepared for getting up, getting down, you know, uh, wall work, all those different things that was helping me shape my game. And, and, and then being able to see these pros train like that, it kind of put me in the forefront of understanding like, Hey, look, this is this is how you prepare. So what I did was I took the the tangibles that they were showing me through those that that, that fight camp from freaking January all the way to April. And I was continuously growing through that fight camp and they asked me those questions of how you prepare, how you recover, all those different things. And I took all those variables and I kept and I kept applying them to every fight camp because at, when I was in every fight camp, I was getting contracts and updates for the fight after that. So I actually didn't wow. stop my fight camp. So I was I was in a fight camp for April won my April fight. And right after that, I was getting prepared for a jiu-jitsu tournament. <laughs> so right after that, May 18th, I got prepared for that jiu-jitsu tournament. Then right before that, they were saying that they had somebody to fight me two weeks before the jiu-jitsu tournament. That I was, was going to fight them in July, which is July 
30th, I believe. So then after that jiu-jitsu tournament, it was no days off. I got right back into the gym and I started preparing after that jiu-jitsu tournament, getting double gold um, in the jiu-jitsu tournament. And I went and uh, for, uh, was going to compete right in July 30th down in uh, Oklahoma. So I was back in fight camp. I actually really didn't take a day off. Like I competed that weekend and I was back in the gym Monday. So that whole time I was in another fight camp, then I ended up fighting again. And then after that fight, I was like, yeah, my body's done. Yeah. Right after that, right after that head kick knockout, uh, which is crazy. Uh, my coach hit me. He was good job. <laughs> my coach, my manager, he said, good job this weekend. I'm like, yeah, appreciate it. He's like, what you doing now? I'm like, I'm going to way back from Oklahoma. I'm going back home. You know, it's Sunday. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm headed back home. He's like, hey, look, I know you don't want to hear this, but we got another <laughs> It's like, what? Are you serious? Yeah. So like, like, Buzz I saw. I like I know you I know you don't I know you don't want to do it. I know you I know your body's banged up some of like that, but it's give me some time. So I'm like, hey, look, I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't really think I can do it. Right now, my body's real banged up. Like my legs is very banged up, you know, I can hardly walk from kicking and all that stuff like that. And so he gave it two days. He's like, Man, I know we talked about this stuff like that, but give it some thought. So hit me two days later. He's like, I think you can really beat this guy. I think you can really beat this guy. Like, man. So then I talked to my coach about it. Then I was just sitting there thinking like so, okay, let's do it. <laughs> like, like I was just like, I was like, let's just do it. And my whole time, and no, no, like this is the complete honest truth. That whole fight camp, I was honestly recovering, just recovering. I was at the cryotherapy, a chiropractor, um, you know, and I was doing that five days out of the week just to recover, to get my, my shoes back, to get all that stuff back. And um, my my manager was like, I know you're so worried about your body and stuff like that and, and being able to get back in 100% uh, shape as close as possible because you're good banged up, but I'm telling you, this is the one you want to take. And then I <laughs> come out and I'm two out of five seconds. <laughs> How fast? Yeah, five seconds. I had the five second knockout. knockout. Oh, yeah, man. So, that all that amazing. That's the thing. Yeah, I thought that, I thought that uh, head kick was pretty crazy too. You're looking like Steve A. check out there just throwing <laughs> that thing and taking was that off. Ad was that a, a jab that you caught him with, and then it was just like you know chainsaw after that man. It was so so honestly like a I, I kind of I got it to the point where it's like you know I did, this kind of how I explained it to people when it was coming down to it. So I watched a lot of film on him, and I got to the point where it's like hey we're trying to figure out what it is that we can do to exploit his weaknesses, and it's not much you can take from it, especially with the amateur ranks. You know you won't really see a lot of film. You don't really get to take a lot of things away from it because a lot of people in the upper. I mean, and as an amateur, you get get you don't get a chance to really see a lot of film when it comes down to him. So for me, I felt like you know my boxing was what was going to go ahead and stand out. So what I did was go ahead and um, exploit that. So what I was doing was making sure that okay, look, I'm not a lot of people know I can, I'm a switch fighter. I fight southpaw fight, um, orthodox. So what I just told myself was like, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come out and, and I'm gonna test his boxing. Let's test his chin. Just come to find out, he started you know playing Perry, and I was like, he don't like to get hit. So he was throwing like a like you know how they test the waters. They're fainting. They're fainting. He didn't really throw a jab at me. I really I just reached for it and parried it, and then I came over the top. Like I'm like I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this my parry, and I hit him. He just dropped from me. So I was like, oh yeah, now I gotta get you. You know. So it was just like um, one of those things that I had to come down to understanding is like that was just proper planning. You know, just proper planning. Mm -hmm. Watching. Understanding how he te how he comes out, to understanding what he does, and then just being able to execute that, and then keeping that in my back in my, in my mind to understand that there's different levels. You know, a lot of people fight, a lot of people just you know want to be able to have the the aurora of hey you're a fighter, but it was also almost like man I do so much stuff. I calculate my, my hours of sleep. I, I, I you know I, I gotta I have my my uh, meal print my meal plan. I'm fully a vegetarian. I have a meal press sponsor. You know, and then also the recovery process that I have with all these different recovery sponsors. Right. And then I have a have a weight room regimen so it was just like you know if anybody's going to beat me you got to beat me in all these different facets it's, it's not like exactly. i'm just like asking to gifted and that's it you know and now right. i'm just better people. it's like i mean i prepare for it if i wasn't the talented gifted person i'm closing that gap by just being able to put a proper proper schedule in place so i'm continuously the consistent i'm continuing the the consistent wins on a daily basis to continue to bridge that gap to the people who are better that makes sense Man, yeah. you know, so, um, I think it's a good definitely. way to, to kind of segue into. You know, I wanted to ask you if that's something that you kind of picked up when you started doing uh, your training. Like you said, you did boxing and, and jujitsu and stuff, or is that something that you kind of picked up back when you were playing football in Lakewood? Oh, um, man, to be quite honest, uh, I feel like, uh, you know, football really has taught me a lot. I think the biggest thing that football has taught me is, is patience and waiting your turn. 
you know, I've, I've, been, I've been blessed to be at so many different schools when it came to college. I've been best, blessed enough to be able to witness so many great athletes and in and, and, and their moments of shining. You know what I'm saying? Like when it came down to it, it's like a, like at Lakewood. I mean, you can name off on your hand, both hands, about how many athletes that came out of there has been, you know, powerhouses in their position or powerhouses just in general. Um, and then being able to witness how they've done it and how they handle it as a as, as as people and as players, but also even outside of Lakewood, even at schools I've been to. You know, I went to a JUCO, your know, junior college, so I was able to see these 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 athletes who could blow up overnight from just having a good game or just from you know whoever they were or just previously having you know success at other schools and coming out of JUCO. So it was almost like I was able to witness these different people get the shine, mess it up from different things they did outside of the sport and uh i was able to keep that and understand like man that's what it that's what it looks like to win that's not that's what we like to lose at all but then i've seen nobody I have no offer to then grind it up and then now it's like they're sitting on top of the world with all these different offers so you know i've seen the best of both worlds and i've always been able to just witness it and it was never my time so the thing was i was able to be able to witness greatness from other people mess it up and then continue to see how they can you know i guess uh Keep going off of that, and it just put me in the perspective of knowing that, hey, when it's my turn, you know, not I, I'm upset. Of course, I, of course, anybody is like, man, when it's my turn, it makes me interested to anybody else, but it always made me more hungry and more anxious of when it will be my turn. So, it'll be understanding those core values and those things that help me understand how to handle all those different things now. You get what I'm saying? So, uh, I think that's one of the biggest takeaways that I can take away to say that, you know, especially with Lakewood, I mean. Surrounded by dogs, surrounded, you're surrounded by these different people that, that put you in perspectives and put you in situations that make you have to elevate because you're around these people who, who are elevating around you. So it's like almost you almost competing to be part of the greatness, not even competing to be against them. It's almost like, man, you got to hold your own weight. If all these different people have these great assets that are bringing to the table, you know what you bring in. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's almost like a potluck of talent. You feel me? So I'm just drinking my own little. Sauce. Yeah, AD, if I could uh, just squeeze in for a second, um, you know, I, I definitely want to get back to Lakewood, but you know, I want the all you young guys, I want y'all to listen to what we're about to talk about. Okay, um, you know, I want to hear, you know, people have different struggles and stuff like that that they go through and hardships and everything. And, uh, you know, you representing the south side of St. Petersburg is kind of, it's very similar to how I represent the south side of Richmond, VA. And, uh, you know, when I was go- growing up in, in Virginia, where I was at, man, it was just it was a, it was that bad neighborhood. You know what I mean? And what I want to know is kind of how your your upbringing is. If you could, you know, mention, you know, your family members that you grew up with. And then maybe dive into like your first sports, and then then I want to hop right back into Lakewood. Okay. Um, so what what I want to do is paint a visual um, about my upbringing, and it's it's nothing to like you know throw shade or anything at anybody, but this is just how I was raised. This is what what I came from. This is what I've seen. This is what I've came across. And this is what I've overcame. So um, I like to. Be- Story of through my lens to let people put in a perspective of where I came from and probably understand of why I am the way that I am. So uh, let's just go. I'm gonna just start off with uh, outside. Let's just paint a picture outside. So a lot of people hear about St. Petersburg who are not from there. They may think about the beaches and stuff like that. But I grew up in in, in the hood, as 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 grimy as you could get. This. Uh, so in the hood, you you have access. And when I say access, it means you can you can partake or you can have this. You can touch this. Can see this on a daily basis. So um, there were, you know, prostitutes, uh, drugs. I'm talking about like drugs. I'm seeing this uh, drugs. And when I say drugs, it's not like uh, uh, you're seeing junkies walk around. It was that. But I'm seeing this. Like for instance, as of right now, like uh, we we would play football down the street, and right now we would have a junkie who would come down, who would go to the. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure you went to a gas station before. You would see a junkie at a. At a not, I wouldn't say junkie. That's probably a little bit too derogatory, but. He, uh, he's asking for money. He's actually he's a homeless person. He's asking for money, asking for something like that. But what this particular person would end up doing is he would stand at the store and what he would do is he'd ask for money. When he would get enough money, he would come down to uh, the, the trap house where we were at. And what he would do is he would, you know, buy his drugs, stuff like that. And what he would do is across the street would be an abandoned house. We call it an abandoned. And he would smoke and bring out his little pipe. He would smoke it right in front of us. 
and then people will repeat the process, rocks, wash, rinse, and repeat, go right back to the store and do that stuff like that until the people would then ask, okay, you can't do that in front of the kids no more, like stuff like that. And we would see people who would walk up and do it, those kind of things. So we would see the drug deals happen and stuff like that. It wasn't, the, we wasn't afraid of it. Oh my God, drugs it was almost like, bro, that's normal. You got people that's coming in here for weed, you got people that's coming in here for a different kind of drug. So this is what we're, we're it's normalized to us, you know? So what it came down to it was um, also the drugs and also the females and stuff like that, you know? It was times where you'll have workers that'll be on the street, uh, on our street, you know, we'll get in school, we'll see them up there on our street, and then we get out of school, they still in the same spot. So, I mean, you can obviously put two and two together. So not only just that, um, you know, the violence, like for instance, like I, like the, for the violence, we'll have big throngs. Like for instance, it'll be like whole family fighting on the street, shooting out, shootouts, all those different things like that. Like I remember one time it was a uh, trap house on our street. Um, if you don't want to trap house, they sell drugs, and what would happen is a U-Haul pulled up. I'm thinking somebody moving into the house. Come to find out, the, the police jump out of the U-Haul truck. We're right there playing football. The police jump out of the so little flashbang, whatever like that. Boom! They tell everybody to get on the ground. I kid you not, at least 20 people and ran out of that back door. So it's just like stuff like that, or stuff like this, where where it would be outside and the car pull up. And then they're they're, they're talking, they're, they're, they start yelling and stuff like that to people that's in the yard where we are, where we live out on the street, and then they'll start fighting right there. there. And then what will happen is the person, that person will come back and retaliate, and there'll be a shootout the next day or that night. So sometimes when they'll have a shootout, if we're inside, we have to get on the ground and stuff like that because, you know, they were shooting through whatever, whatever. So it is stuff like that we will witness. Like even once I was playing football, there was a police chase on our street. I remember they're running through the they're running through the uh the houses and, and the fields and stuff like that where we're playing football and they run on our street. We're trying to tell them which way to go. Uh, we're like, hey, we're this way. Next thing you know, he got caught. Like ten minutes later, he's walking out and they got the, the, the whole block around with police and everything like that. So it was just like witnessing stuff like that outside tell of me, our tell, tell cyborg. Me this. cyborg. Were you telling yeah. the guy? That was running where to go, or are you telling the cop where to go? No. <laughs> he ran up on Hey, go this way. So it's just I'm like, I'm like, I'm like 20 years old, like, you know, 12 years old. Like, these are just things that we just witnessed. Or, like, say, for instance, like, you know, like where we were, where we were, where we were at, we would always run into these different people. We would always run into these different people, you know what I'm saying, who were. Who were doing certain things, and we were, we were just kids, so we we're seeing these things firsthand, and, and we're not knowing any better about how to be able to deal with some of the circumstances that we have. So, for instance, I have friends who had a little bit better money than what I had, you know. So I can go ahead and talk about the living arrangements that me and my friends had. So, for instance, I had friends who had money who had both of their parents in the household. So stuff like that, I was always envious of people who had both parents in the household who actually had money for lunch, dinner, and breakfast. If I didn't go to if I didn't go to school that day, I wasn't getting lunch. If I didn't go to school that day, I wasn't getting breakfast. So, for instance, that made me always want to go to school. Plus, it was fun. I was able to do something throughout the day, and I didn't have to stay in my house. Now, I'm going to talk about my friends who, who, who were able. They were able to get games and stuff. They had Christmas, Christmas, actual Christmas, like Christmas presents, family there, Christmas dinner, a pantry. I didn't figure out what a pantry was until one of my friends let me inside his house. He told me, like, bro, it's like a food closet. It's like, you got a food closet? Bro, I don't even got enough food fridge to even – to put in my fridge. How you got enough food to put in your fridge, in your cabinets, in your closet? So it's just stuff like that that I end up not being accustomed to, but it was just what I witnessed. So then let's go back into how I was living back in my house. So, um, hey, I my yeah. My dad is from Appalachia, Virginia. And he okay. did not know that he had a birthday until he was 10 years old. Whoa. Wow. I mean, that's like kind of like they actually had Christmas. Like they didn't have birthdays. Like yeah. he said, hey yeah. man, come over to my my house. I'm we're gonna have cake and ice cream. My dad said, You can have cake and ice cream for what? And they said, because it's a birthday. He said, What's a birthday? Yeah, oh, wow. that's crazy, man. Because he's you're from totally different places, but you know the same struggle. And I, I know oh. you probably don't remember me, but I coached football at Virginia Union University. And I okay. tried to get you to come to Virginia Union, man. Do you remember that? Yeah, the whole conversation we have it. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, bro. I remember that be time like and 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 the thing is it's like a lot of times i was good at I was, me and my, me and my, my mom was very prideful i was very prideful because i felt like i was living was embarrassing so for instance let's just go out to how i was living just to make, paint the picture put everything in perspective so that was going on outside of the neighborhood and everything like that which caused me to then act up in school and stuff like that so in the household we have is my grandma my mom me my little brother my older brother and my uncle at the time who then moved out later on mom doesn't have a car um no job. Um, so we're getting government assistance. And then we're also on the weekends, we're going to uh, food, food, what pantries, what they call them, uh, Salvation Army, 
yeah, church giveaways, like where they're giving out food and stuff like that. So we did that on weekends, so that my mom was getting paid once a month. So what was happening was um, there's there's holes in the ceiling, there's holes in the floor. If it's raining outside, it's raining inside. If it's hot outside, it's hot inside. No insulation or nothing like that. So that's not that's 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 okay, that's that's normal in a sense. So with that being said, anytime there was rain, we had to put buckets and stuff like that out and everything to catch the water. Or if it was really hot outside, we had to make sure the windows are open. But then what would happen is roaches and different animals would then come inside the house. Like I remember, uh, so these things were then ample. It, it made every lot of things worse inside. But what was happening was that house was built in like the 50s, 60s, probably 40s. So it was very, 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 very old. Like if there's a hole through the floor, you can literally see the, the leaves and stuff under the house. Or you can see the bricks that it was stacked up on top of. That's how old the house was. The house was built and then it was on top of bricks, you know? So they didn't even build houses like that anymore. So, but that being said, um, you know, what else was that we had rats and roaches. It was so loud. It took me to the point where it was like, you can't sleep because the rats and roaches that's going through the wall and the ceiling and underneath the bed were so loud. You, you really couldn't even whisper to the person next to you because of how loud it was. It was to the point yeah. where I couldn't, I couldn't lay, I couldn't go to the, to, to the bathroom in the middle of the night because I know like if I turn the light on there, Scatter yeah, everywhere. We call, we call them friends where I'm from. No. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. hey, hey, AD, uh, how about uh, did, were you doing, were you even able to do sports then? Or did you, you know, was it until you got to high school? Uh, to be quite honest, I wasn't able to do sports. I, 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 my actually first love was was fighting. I, I actually wanted to do karate and stuff like that, but we didn't have the money for it. Plus, you know, on the south side where I'm from, no car or anything like that. So we don't have access to be able to go to these different places. You know, so we just came like, I wasn't able to even play any kind of sports. And then, you know, especially with how we were living, I was always embarrassed at how we were living. So I, I used to be conflicted with what I'm able to do because my mom, she's midlife crisis. You know, we can't even use our bathroom. Like, we're shitting in, in garbage bags and grocery bags because we can't even have ice talk bathroom because the water pipe bust and the floor uh, fell, caved through. So we don't even have a bathroom anymore. Mind you, my grandma has bad knees, so she can't even go to the bathroom anymore. So you guess how she's using the bathroom or guess how she's taking a shower and stuff like that. It just lost stuff along those lines. So what I ended up doing was my my cousin's boyfriend actually signed me up for my first year of football um, when I was like in what, seventh seventh grade, eighth grade, something along those lines. But I never could. Oh, but I did play when I was li little league. I did play, uh, but it was um, I was a little fat kid. I, I had made it because I couldn't breathe. Was it for Little like Lakewood? Was it for the Little Lakewood Spartans? I think it was Gibbs where I, where I okay. stayed at. Um, okay. So um, I also played for Silver Raiders as well. Um, but it was just like um, I was able to play football, but my first outlet was fighting. But then when I finally got the chance to be able to play football, I played for Isaiah one year, and then I was able to play for Lakewood. That's when a lot of stuff still was happening, and my only outlet really was that because by the time I was actually in high school, a lot of the, a lot of the arrangements at my house were really very different. I was staying with my sister. I was also, um, you know, just trying to find a way to be able to get through what I was going through. And it was showing in my class. I wasn't being up. I wasn't, I wasn't making it to practice. I wasn't even showing up to school because of me and going back and forth with my mom because of how I was living. I always wanted a better way to live, but I didn't know the ins and outs of what was going on on the parenting side of why she couldn't do X, Y, and Z. So I was challenging her belief while hearing, hey, you should have X, Y, and Z because of child support and everything like that. So me and my mom was at at odds. And people didn't even notice, but when I was at Lakewood, I, used to, I was in a group home for a certain period of time because of what was going on with my mom, jumping out a two-story window because I saw her boyfriend and it was, it was locked home. I, I was over there to my sister's house. When I went into my sister's house, they had already reported me as a runaway because the day before, I already fought her boyfriend and they called me in that morning because I ran away. So then when I ran, ran away, they, I went to the police station to report what happened to me that night. They said, hey, look, y'all been called him as a runaway. You can either, you can either go to jail or come to this detention center or you can go to the, a group home. I chose the group home. So I was there for a amount of time, still trying to make it to practice, still trying to go to school and stuff like that, and I haven't a certain amount of things. So it was just a lot of stuff I was just dealing with, and I felt like, you know, I felt like Coach Moore and – Yeah, that's – uh, real quick, AD, let me, let me cut in real quick. That's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about, like, your – your freshman, sophomore year, and then, you know, I, I want to tag in myself because that's when I finally get in touch and I finally meet you. So what you're telling me is a guy I never met before, you know. Yeah, so uh, if you could, yeah. you know, just go through that, uh, what it was like to be on a Coach Moore team and, you know, to kind of grind your way up to your senior year. So freshman year, I actually really didn't even play football my freshman year. It was just so much stuff going on. I didn't really go to school. Um, it was just so much stuff happening, happening in my household and then just not really even focused on school at all. It was just so much stuff that I was just wrapped up in, just trying to get myself going, uh, trying to figure out life at that point. Um, 
you know, uh, so then uh, I would say my sophomore year was my first year playing. You know, uh, I was talking to Coach Moore about me playing. I forgot how it happened. Uh, I remember one of my best friends in the neighborhood that I was raised in, they went to the same coach, they went to the same church as Coach Moore. So then I remember meeting him for the first, like I think the very first time in church. But then I remember going to, to try out, you know, for the team and stuff like that. And, you know, uh, he even got me cleats and all that because I couldn't afford none of this stuff. Like, I couldn't. Know how he's going, so he ended up giving me a pair of cleats, and I ended up trying out. And we ended up, they ended up putting me at quarterback, um, because they like how I threw, and they was like, Hey, what do you want to play? And I told them receiver and stuff, and they was trying to put me at quarterback and receiver. And <laughs> but uh, there was so many other fast guys out there that I ended up working my way into being an inside slot guy at a tight end, and then you know, um, just being able to be out there with those guys, it kind of put me in a perspective of like man, this is how you train for football. Like, this is what football is. This is what kind of like a brotherhood is. At first, it was kind of like real overwhelming because I wasn't so used to these many people being there for me at one time and pushing me like that, you know? Yeah. So not having a father figure, it kind of put me in a sense of like, you know, do these people really care about me? Like, why, why are they doing, why are they going out of their way when I'm not asking for it? Or they don't know what I'm dealing with. Why are they sitting here, you know, dealing with somebody who's such a knucklehead, you know, in a sense, it kind of put me in perspective of, like, is this what a dad's supposed to be? You know, so I kind of right, had this, right. like, support system of, 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 of yeah. men who kind of believed that I was able to do something that was bigger than myself. So they end up pouring into me more than I felt like I needed. And it was just one of those things where it was just like, it made me want to keep competing because on a daily basis, it made me feel like, this was my avenue out of what I was going through. And they made it, they made it, they made sure that I seen that potential before so I could be able to, you know, shape my future the right way. Right. Now, let me ask you this, like you're, so you, you started, you know, you did varsity sophomore and junior year uh, records wise there, they were, they were, you know, they were trending up. Uh, I believe your junior year, y'all were maybe seven and three or seven and four. Um, and, and what position were you playing then? And then let me know when you want to go into your senior year and, I, and I'll get you kind of squared away where I got kind of tagged in and, you know, and I, I want to explain what I saw from you and, and what I walked into, if you could. So my junior year was, uh, it was crazy because, uh, it was supposed to be like my year to kind of put people on notice of like how good I, I could be and how good I was and stuff. But I ended up messing it up. I think I ended up, but yeah, that was the year I think I got. I got hurt, and I also ended up throwing my jersey back. That's what happened my junior year. All right, I know the jersey story. Yeah, back the black and gold games. So yeah, knucklehead, you know. So what's the jersey um, story, AD? Okay, so this is the jersey. <laughs> and who is the jersey. coach? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so everybody knows about this story. I went like that. That played football with me. They all know about the story. So what happened was, we, uh, I had just got back on the team. I didn't have enough money to get my paperwork and stuff done. Um, or even get all my prep work and stuff situated. I was still, I was at a group home um, and I was still getting my stuff situated, I believe. And what ended up happening was I finally got all my stuff squared away because the coaches paid for it and they got me get back on the team. So the week, the next week, we ended up having our black and gold game and they're giving out jersey numbers. Mind you, I just got back and I'm like, okay, boom, my number was number 19. They just had a new kicker who got on there and he gave the kicker my number. So then I came in there, the coach, Z was like, hey, so you come in there, he smiles at me like, hey, yeah, 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 I got something special for you here. He's like, <laughs> So he was like, yeah, so uh, this this number we're going with. So here you go. This is right for you. So he gives me number 47, 49. <laughs> and I'm like, so this me, this this mine for the game? <laughs> I get it. I ball it up, and I throw it down, and I just walk out. I'm like, all right, cool. And I throw it out, and I throw it out. So my guy just got back on the team like a week or two ago, and so then they come back in there. They shoot me out. Like, you know, we just got the opportunity to come back here and play, and you're throwing it all away because of that. We were testing you. We were testing you to see what you were going to do and where your character was. And in that, in that moment in time, they kicked me off the football team, and I wasn't able to even play or anything like that. And I was supposed to come back, but – it was just too late. They they just stood on they they stood on their morals and everything like that. And I was able I wasn't able to come back. Um, and then uh, I kind of messed my whole junior receipt my junior year up because of that whole situation. I didn't get a chance to play. They were going to give me the jersey after the game just to see where my focus was and see where I was I was going to take that. And it was just one of those things where I just kind of failed the little test they have for me. Uh, so I kind of was like, wow, like I just threw everything away while I'm dealing with the stuff at home and everything like that. So springtime, I kind of had like a vengeance, like, hey, this is the time I have to get my stuff together. Or it's like, there's no way I'm going to be able to do what I need to do for my family if I don't make it out of St. Petersburg, Florida. So 
Right. So, and, uh, you know, at that time I had just moved, uh, from plant city, Florida over here. And, uh, and me and my wife, we got a amazing place and I really wanted to do something. You know, I had this stuff still in me and I wanted to, you know, go and, and do something for my community. And, uh, you know, what I did, there was this, uh, forum, it was big County preps, Florida forum, and it was coaches from all over and, you know, they would just talk about everything, football and coaching. And, uh, you know, I looked up and I found out where Lakewood was. It was the closest place to me. Uh, I never, I never, uh, you know, Googled it or, you you know, I never Wikipedia did. I, I just, I just went up there. I called coach Moore and said, coach, uh, you know, I want to volunteer, you know, could y'all use some help? You know, I, I, I I work on O line, D line. You know, if if if, if that'll work, and uh, Coach Moore was actually just going to the Jacksonville Jaguars, and uh, oh, yeah. you know he was interning there, and he yeah. was like, you know, uh, yeah, get, you know, go in there, show up to the weight room, man, see see what's up, and if you're you're here when I get back, you know, uh, just, just you know, we'll we'll roll with you, and uh, man, I just remember stepping in there, and. I noticed really quick that not a, not a lot of people looked like me and not a lot of people talked like me. Uh, but I could see, you know, in these guys' eyes. And it was awesome because everybody had these white, you know, just white T-shirts. Everybody had white T-shirts, black shorts, and not very fancy shoes, you know. So everybody looked exactly alike. And, uh, you know, I just jumped in there. We started working out right away. And, uh, you know, I remember just – I couldn't believe the size of some of these guys, man. We had uh, uh, Big Easy, Nikwell Alexander, who also played uh, basketball for the team. But the guy was six foot six and weighed 400 pounds, and he also played center for the basketball team, man. He was an athlete. Uh, we, another guy that, you know – you know, rest in peace to Logan McNeil, Logan McNasty, man. This guy was probably 6'3", six, 6'4", three, six, 300 pounds. I swear the guy benched 500 pounds, you know, at, in high school. You know, we had Isaiah Wynn there. We had we had all these guys that were just uh, tremendous. And, you know, I, I worked all summer with them. And I like to do mental workouts, different stuff. I, I was loving MMA and I like doing those kind of workouts and everything. And, you know, I would have guys do workouts where we hold certain weight, you know, straight out to see who can hold it the longest. And, uh, you know, AD was always one of those guys that whatever I put out there, man, he was always one of the final guys you know, in the task, man. He was always one of the last man standing, I like to say. And, uh, you know, I, I did. I just fell in love with these guys. I coached all the offensive linemen. And I tried to make it like a brotherhood with, with, with us. Like we were a gang inside of a gang. You know what I mean? And one of the things I did that I remembered, you know, I wanted to get, get you know, I wanted to, uh, you know, do something for the guys. And sometimes in your life, when you're not feeling right, if you go do something good for somebody, it's going to come right back to you. So uh, what I did, and Coach Hutch, you're going to love this. I stole the mentality of the Virginia Tech lunch pail. Okay, I got a lunch pail from an uncle of mine that was in World War II, and he 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 actually got shot, and he uh, he lit he lived, but he got a medal and everything, and you know he got uh, honorably discharged. And he was a mailman and he walked every single day to work for 40 years after that. So I got that lunch pail from him. And what I told these guys was, you know, I said, look, this is what we're going to do, guys. You know, we're going to start, you know, a new tradition. And that's what was amazing. I went to coach more about it. And, you know, and coach Pollock, who uh, unbelievable coach there, and both of those guys were like, do they're your boys, too, man. You know, go go for it. Do it. And, uh, you know, what I did in, inside that lunch pail is I put something that I wanted the guys to have, you know, something maybe they didn't have. You know, I put a, a, put a pair of lineman gloves in there. I put a, a, a Ray Lewis jersey in there. You know, one guy got a Maurice Jones Drew jersey. You know, it was something small out of my pocket. But, man, when those guys opened that pail and, and I looked in their eyes, Oh, man, it was – I'll never forget it. 
You know, it meant so much to me. And I don't know, I, I just got a feeling that some of those guys might tell their grandkids about it. You know what I mean? It was just one of those very inspiring things that I did. And, uh, you know, probably about our second or third game, we played a team that had uh, – they went two and two, and they were pretty good. And, man, my offensive line, man, those guys were just – we were just wrecking shop, man. I mean, we were mowing guys. You would just see the whole line move five or six yards down the field before anybody would catch contact, you know. And we had uh, – everybody just seemed to buy in. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I just – I'm so blessed about that, and I'm so glad, you know, when, a, when I first met A.D., I freaking I, – I, I love the guy, man. I mean, he looked just like me, you know what I mean? And it was amazing because I didn't know the struggle that he had went through. But this guy, I just – right away, man, like we had him as a hybrid kind of tight end, kind of like a Gronkowski. Because, man, this dude would put dicks in the dirt, boy. He would he – would, he, he would definitely, man. He would he would pancake city, man. And, you know, it was like having an a extra lineman out there. And then, man, he's one of our fastest guys. We throw the throw the ball down the middle. He'd make a big play. And uh, but I believe we could have played him at any anywhere. I think he could have played linebacker. He could have played DN. Hell, he could have been Derrick Henry, man. You know, he was uh, just a stud. And uh, it was awesome because he had already bought into everything. And uh, you know, it was just it was so so good to 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 be on that squad. And uh, yeah, man, I'm gonna throw it back to you. Uh, Ad, you what know, was it like playing that senior year with those guys? You know, the Twins and Isaiah Wynn and those other guys that made it to the NFL. Yeah, man, get, like? give a shout to some of those guys, man. Hey, AD, you there? Did you say, how was it playing? Yeah, yeah, here. yeah, Play, yeah you said, how was it playing with the Twins? With the Twins and Isaiah Wynn and those other guys that played in the NFL. Um, I, I would honestly say like it was almost like you, you, you kind of like witnessing all that stuff happen at one time. It was almost like being in those moments. It's almost like you see it, you you watching a great run go. It's like it's kind of hard to really explain, you know, like being a part of a team like that with so much like charisma and so much great things happening all at one time. It was almost to the thing where it's like you never wanted to end. It was like one of the good movies where you just never wanted to end at all. So like. I was just like so so happy at just being able to be a part of something like that with knowing that I was an asset for it, you know. Oh. So it was something that I honestly just never wanted it to end. It was one of those things that it just hurt, it turned us, turned our mouth sour when everything happened the way it happened for us to not be in the situation that we needed to be in because we thought we were going to go all the way that senior year. So, uh, like being a part of a, uh, a, a culture where we thought that, like, we seen, we're like, man, all of us going to the league. You know, it's like, bro, there's no way that there's people out here in the country that's, it's not too many people that's better than us as a team. It's not too many people that's better than us individuals or even position wise, you know? So we always thought that we could stack up against anybody in the country and to have that so early on, it was almost like, man, I wish I could kind of have this moment forever. You know what I'm saying? Like, we know we go ahead of that after that moment, but it was just almost like, man, I'm just so upset because it was people that were playing on a team that weren't, like, we felt like wouldn't even buy into it if we didn't have the kind of culture that we had. We got people who weren't even football players buying into the program and feeling like, hey, look, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life right now, you know? So it's just people that we just had where we, you know, you just never get a bomb like that or have things pass up on you like that um, too many times in, in, in life. So playing with them was kind of like, you know? Without a doubt, AD. I want to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna give you a couple coaches' names, and uh, you know, I got to start with uh, Coach Moore. You know, if you could, uh, just tell me what kind of influence he was, and maybe still is with you, and uh, maybe a good quick story so they can kind of figure out who, what kind of coach he was. Um. So, <laughs> I mean, I would you, say bought your cleats. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So what I would say is like um. So you said Coach Moore, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> I would say Coach Moore was more so like uh, I would just say Coach Moore probably is the, one of the funniest people I know. So sarcastic, so like he was like a father figure for all of us because he was so involved, you know. Um, so so made, made made us pay attention to things that we didn't even think that was important, but made us understand it was so important by the way he talked to us. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like little stuff like that, and then on top of that, with him being as big as he is, and, and him him like. <laughs> I, I would think that he's one of those things where he would intimidate you by just him doing off the wall stuff, you know, stuff like, <laughs> you know, like, man, we, I, I can't believe, I, I can tell you this right now. I've never done so many up downs in my life from us, from, you know, 
uh, we're not running hard on sprints. One person not running hard on sprints. We found out we were all doing up downs one day, and uh, one kid was hiding. We, one kid was hiding in the in the, in the uh, he was hiding. I forgot where he was hiding at. Was behind. <laughs> so, yeah, he's having this shit. When I say he made us start over, <laughs> do those up downs over and over again. Like bro, it's game day. It's game day. So I forgot what had happened. I think somebody was cutting up in class. Being being that bad in class and man, up down in our we came to school in suits, uh, like with, with a uh, button down shirt, tie, and slacks. Yeah. He made us up game day. in that. <laughs> he made us game day on the on the game field in that. Like it was just like we even did we did you know inside we did inside run in the wrestling room because <laughs> it was raining yeah. outside. We all our equipment on, so I'm like like full contact. So it was just stuff like that. We just knew. I was like, bro, this man is crazy. But 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 then he would show us values and talk to us after practice to make us understand is why he did what he did because he'd make it be like, man, this man care enough to put us through. This. He also made you understand that if I get in trouble, I know he's gonna make us do outlandish stuff. You know, like he made me put around this seventy pound bag of equipment around a track and field because I was just talking. I think I was talking back. I was doing something, or how he was disciplining us with how we were run. Like for instance, like. How much we were running, the kind of exercise that we was doing, the weight room things that we were doing, made us really feel deep down in our heart that he was crazy. Like this man is absolutely crazy. But you hey, know, that's I, a man, that's like, a perfect lead in right here next because I want to hear uh, your your opinion on uh, Coach Kimball, and I want to hear a story about him because uh, he was to me, uh, Coach Taylor, Coach Hutch. He was like the enforcer. You know, when you messed up, or when Coach Moore didn't want to have nothing to do with you, man, you got to go with Coach Kimball. And uh, you know, I, when I first met him, okay, I go in the gym, and he's just sitting there, and it's, it's three fifteen behind him. He's all decked out in fatigues, and he everybody, you know, and and you know, he's sitting there watching everybody. Next thing you know, he just starts repping it out like no problem. You know, just walks in the gym all fatigued out, and it was just like, you know, and built like a, built like an NFL fullback. You know what yeah, I mean? It, and, and the golds, the gold I, the I, I can't wait to see you knock somebody out, man. Whenever you fight next, <laughs> I want to see you maul that guy, man. I want to see. I got you. You got me right now. <laughs> hey, what's, what's more, I might go get into a fight later tonight. <laughs> hey, so, hey, so I remember one time, the crazy thing about Coach Moore, we were sitting there, um, two stories. It was, we were sitting there, we were trying to, I think it was 215. We were, uh, what was it? Incline, bitch? I kid you not. So no, he was like, hey, put, put the seat down. So we go to bench. He's like, hey, put me two more 45s on there. It's like two more 45s. Mine just already 215 on there. So I'm like, he's like, yeah, give me some more. So we like, hey, coach, you're not going to be able to do that. He's like, hey, can you swap me real quick? So we go behind him. He's like, all right, take it off. Help me take it off. He's like, no, nah, never mind. I got it. And he just started repping it. And we like, yeah. what? Yeah. You see this? This how you work. This how you work. They just talk me the whole time. Another story. Actually, fine. We, we, we're going bowling. We're going bowling. He was all like, we're like, Coach, why you come bowling with us? Like, we, we you should have bowled with us, man. It was so fun. He was like, oh, freaking bowl. <laughs> he was like, I've got my freaking – it reminds you, he never cussed. Never cussed. Always he was freaking. Talking. Yes, it was always freaking or pissed. <laughs> like, pissed. <laughs> he said, what am I bowl for? But I'll grab my freaking Tahoe and throw it down the lane. And that's how I'm going <laughs> So he just talked like that. Like it, it, and, and the thing is, he actually had us talking like that. We picked up the mentality from our coach. And from Kimball, crazy, this is how I got introduced to Kimball. I got in trouble from coming to uh, practice late. And I was one of those, the goofy standouts, just, but I was just, I was, I was just goofy as heck. So we're in there. He was like, hey, I'm going to sit you with Kimball. He like Kimball, give him something. This was the time that I got. They call a birthday, a big, a big uh military backpack full of a whole bunch of stuff. I had to be like 70, 80 pounds. <laughs> you had to run around a track with rock. So, so he's out there talking to me while I have it on me. So as he's talking to me, I'm laughing, not even knowing what I'm getting myself into. So he's laughing. He's like, <laughs> so afterwards, he said he ended up telling me that day. He said I remember that like it was yesterday. He was like, I don't know what's wrong with you. He's like, but you crazy. He was like, he's like. <laughs> Trying to get it to where I quit, but I was just thinking to myself like, it's a, 
it's a heavy backpack. Like, why, why y'all taking this stuff so serious? You know, so I was, I was just a knucklehead. So after that, he keep telling me, telling me, lady was like, man, you know, I didn't even like y'all. He's like, coach, I don't have no soft side. I don't, I don't even like these kids. They always giggling. They always, they always, they always laughing and stuff like that. So he was like, all right, every time anybody got in trouble, you would sit on the kimble and you'll have you doing some crazy stuff, you know. Uh, so it was just one of those things where he ended up being somebody who ended up opening up his soft side because he was able to have us, the youth, bring him in and have him have that access of understanding that you don't have to be so serious and you always was a goofy person, but we was opening that side up too because, I mean, we were all we were all so goofy, like, you know, just us kids being kids. Yeah. And, and he never had any bad language come out of his mouth, correct? No, 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 close, close. Everybody was close. Everybody, everybody, everybody never cussed. None of our coaches cussed. Everybody was so, so, so close. So that was and the funny me, thing about it. Let me ask you about uh, Coach Pollock, man. He was uh, he was the head OL coach, and, man, me and him, we just collaborated so well. He would be up in the booth, and he'd tell me who to yell at. So it was, uh, it was pretty good stuff. Pollock, I, you know, Pollock went through this thing where it was like – when Pollock wasn't our coach, like Pollock, see, he worked in the school. So Pollock, when Pollock wasn't our coach, Pollock was so like, just damn. Like I think he, I felt like he didn't like football players or, or like us because he was always, you know, what I'm saying in the hallways and he had to be on us. And you know, a lot of the football players, some of the football players, would cause trouble and stuff. So he was real hard on us, like you know, like no leeway, no nothing ever. But when he started, like you know, coaching football and understanding us more and being around us more, he kind of like got a soft side for us. You know, so it, it, it kind of put me in an understanding of like, you know, Coach Coach Pollock was really, you know, I think he more understood us better of why we acted the way we acted. That we wasn't just out here in school just being knuckleheads or whatever. It was just like, man, this is who we are. So it kind of took a liking to us, especially he was coaching the old line. Like those, so those probably were some of the funniest people on the football team. You can't sit up here and be serious. Uh, you can't sit up here and be serious uh, around Isaiah Wynn. Uh, Anthony Huggerbook and uh, May Rest in Peace, uh, Logan McNeil. There's no way all the big guys are playing. So it's like there's no – you can't be serious around them guys, you know. So especially when you – especially when they're arguing about who more, who, who, who's more fat. Like, who, like what? <laughs> How, who's fat? So, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Good stuff. And, <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess we're going to have to, you know, did you guys think I was a police officer right away? Or, you know, let, let me hear a, a Coach K story and, you know, what, what you thought about me. This is – I'm excited to hear about this, man. I've never really got any feedback or anything. What's funny is, though, because you always came in with the shades on. So we ain't never – we like, who is dude? Like, you know, because every around us, like, it was it was no white people on top. It was no people, really white people besides the trainers or our <laughs> And stuff, and you just came in out of nowhere. Like I remember you walking in the weight room, and we we're like, well, "Who is dude?" Like I know one of y'all got trouble. He came in with shades, and he's nobody yet. So I'm like, "What's going on? Who is Coach K?" He started, started talking to you and, and realizing it was just like he always was like so fired up. Like like we was always trying to figure out like, "Man, what are y'all like? What's the, why, why is he so fired up?" Like so, I just remember us, you know, hey, we was practicing, practicing this hey. stuff. Ad, let me let me cut you off real quick. Let me tell you this part too. Uh, you know, I just did it as a volunteer part, and throughout that whole process, man, I was working, and I would leave uh, my house at four a.m. every morning to go to Tampa and work from four forty-five until three o'clock every single day. Then I would get up with you guys. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, I I I appreciate you uh, you definitely saying that, and uh, you know. Uh, that's that's good stuff, man. Thank you very much. Keep going, man. Keep going. This is good. Yeah. So, so it, and it was crazy because it was sometimes I remember talking to a uh, book about uh, Coach K. And I'd be like, man, hey, y'all, th y'all think Coach K? Uh, uh, I think he close to getting this inside with us. Like he look like he finna put his hand in the dirt right now. Like, <laughs> like, because he's like he came out of nowhere, but he always has just so much energy. Like. You know, like everybody, like, like everybody brought something different to the table when it came down to our coaching staff. But when it was like you, when the times you would come in, it was just like we just always know, like you was on ten. Like we almost like, bro, we need to get him a helmet and some shoulder pads or something because you know he just was always on ten. But that was kind of the energy we sometimes needed because you know if we didn't get that kind of relief from each other because it was always serious, serious with all the stuff we was going through. We had to be on this on that and on the football field. It was always anal, always anal with certain things. So with you being able to give us that kind of encouragement to keep going, like, hey, look, do this, do this, it was almost like a soft undertone of us being able to 
understand like okay cool now we ain't just getting yelled at and be not be little but you know what i'm saying there was a different type of encouragement that it was excited for us to see it was more so like a positive encouragement you know almost like him him being that 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 that, that field trip uncle that was always you know, I say you go to their house and then, you know, the rules a little bit lax and stuff like that. But he's always like, fun, fun. Hey, go, 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 get it, get it, get it. So it's just kind of like this different approach of how he was coaching us. Was like, you know, we just love that kind of enthusiasm um, because everybody was real enthusiasm and they were showing their passion. But it was just how he showed it in different ways made us feel like, man, I got to go hard because I can't really let him down. I can't let him turn it down. And I don't want him to turn it down. And I feed off that energy. So it just helped us out entirely, man. Oh, man, definitely. Uh, you know, I tried to – I wanted you guys to kind of play with more of an edge. And uh, do you remember the the lunch pail gimmick at all? Did that ring any bell? I, I, it, was a, it, was a, it was a while ago. I just, I, I just remember coming in. I don't think I was present when – I, I came in after when they had opened it and everything like that because I remember okay. it was kind of lunch. Yeah, and then yeah. I remember them walking around with lunch pail. It was like – it was just telling me how how uh, how big the lunch pail and stuff was. They were just making jokes and stuff about it. It was like, man, he really came and brought us all this stuff. Like, y'all remember like, – <laughs> What is what's he trying to do? So it was just funny how they were just like, man, he probably rich, man. He probably he probably finna get us all new, all this and stuff like that. It was so funny. <laughs> it was just so uh, you gotta you gotta get a, a lunch pail for your fights now, and every time you get another knockout, you add your uh, tape in there, start filling that yeah. tape and blowing up. Yeah, that'd be that'd be hard. Get a lunch pail and just add all my memorabilia to it. Yeah, that that, that would be hard. I I didn't think about that. I was actually you know what I was thinking about. I was thinking about getting one of those. You know, like you know, like on. Uh, what is it? On the, on the college football, they always they, they come out and then some people they have like a flag and they like wave the flag and stuff like that. I was thinking about getting a flag like that, but getting my actual logo on one side, the face logo on one side, and then my main logo on the other side. And then just always walking out with that. I was thinking about doing that, but I gotta get somebody to make something like that for me. So I don't know, just wish I think yeah. This guy right here knows how to do all that stuff. Yeah, man. I definitely uh I definitely oh, want yeah. your rookie cards, man. We gotta get you some sports cards, man. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'll definitely get to that. Yeah, I'm all, I'm all into that stuff. Like that. I always need a new area to venture off into. Now, so, hey, I want to transition just for a second because uh, Coach Taylor joined a little bit late. Uh, you're fighting Saturday, correct? Yeah, Saturday. Yeah, so, right. is, how uh, can we watch that? Is it going to be live streamed anywhere? Is there any way that we can get uh, access to watch that? Yeah, so actually it's going to be live streamed through Synergy FC uh, website, so SynergyFC.com. What they're going to be doing is they're going to be having a little live stream service, and you can be able to go on there and, uh, and live stream it from there. It costs a little pay per view. It's just to help them out with how they be able to have full access to being able to, you know, watch it in real time. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's how you'll be able to catch it. I'll be very excited. And I'm going to be close to the end. Of, there's an Andy card and a pro card. Um, I was supposed to be one of the uh, title fights, but a lot of stuff ended up happening to the point where we're just fighting not for a title. But um, it just ended up working out of my favorite still to be on that card. And I'm still fighting towards the end of any card. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be a great show, man. Some of my teammates are coming up there to fight with me. Uh, so two of my teammates are. So it's going to be a great, great, great run-in event. So it's really exciting. I'm really excited to go show, show what else I can do. You said that you liked the fight growing up. Is that street fights? And – I, I'm I'm a fan of Mike Tyson, and Mike Tyson said he loves fighters, and I I, I love coaches. I'm a football coach, and I, he said he studied all the great fighters. I mean, he's talking about like Achilles, Charlemagne, Alexander yep. the Great. Like, yep. do you, do you? And he said he fought because he was scared. You know, his first fight was because a dude stole killed his pigeons. Like, yep. do yep. you feel any like empathy or? The same as Mike Tyson. Uh, I, I know this may sound a little bit messed up, like, uh, but honestly, I don't, I don't, I don't really empathize with nobody I'm fighting for real, for real. I don't really want to touch gloves. I really don't. Um, I, I feel like a lot of things that I'm fighting for is way bigger than how they may feel. So I can't really reason with them with how I hurt them. I can't really find reason in, um, in it because a lot of things that I'm fighting for is way bigger than my. It's the purpose that I'm fighting for is way bigger than my feelings or their feelings at all. So I can't empathize on what I'm going to do to somebody when I'm trying to go ahead and, you know, hurt them to the, the farthest extent. My duty is to really hurt them until the ref stop me. Um, and so what is that of, purpose? My purpose is honestly, man, I feel like I, I feel like it's a lot of things that I've been done in my, in my past and done wrong that I haven't been able to let go of. And what I've been able to do is kind of like use it as my revenge tour. It's in a sense of that, that showing people that, yeah. you know, I am, I am who I am and I'm everything that I'm meant to be, especially when it wasn't my time to shine, but also understanding that people treated me the way that they treated me and probably wrote me off as a castaway or this, that, and the third. And 
probably just proving that I'm able to have everything that I wanted to be living the life that I wanted to live. Also being able to fight for the life that I always wanted to have and all the pain and suffering from my upbringing, from how I was raised through my the parent, my mom, or the, the damage that was done from my mom or from my ass and dad, or just different things of that nature. It put me in a perspective of understanding that somebody got to pay for this. A lot of people say you got to forget and forgive, but the thing is, what I'm supposed to do with this pain that I'm still harboring, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to say, let go and let God, but my thing is, what happens when I get those intrusive thoughts of when that pain comes back? You know, somebody got to pay for that. You know, I got to deal with that for the rest of my life. And the things that may happen when I was eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, 12, 15, well, that pain still resonates with me. So, you know, how can I sit up here and go out there and, and wish that man the best of luck that I don't hurt him? You know, it's just one of those things where you better bite down on your mouthpiece and just hope and pray that, you know, the ref jumps in in time for me to be able to do what I need to do and not finish you off because I'm just going there to, 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 to make sure that, you know, <laughs> that I, I'm honestly trying to inflict so much damage to the point where, you know, I don't really want to say that, but I'm really to the point where I just I want to hurt people really bad. But I just know that I'm coming from a place of knowing that I mean I've suffered so much panic attacks from suffering from these different forms of anxiety. Like I got a general anxiety disorder, major depression disorder, um, recovering from PTSD, and I have ADHD combined type. So for me to be sitting here and um, you know, I can't have I can't have sympathy or empathy for anybody that I'm fighting. You know, it's just it just goes that deep. So yeah, when it when it you know it was one time I remember this. Uh, I was talking to I, I fought my second MMA fight. I was fighting, um, and I got the cons most consecutive knees in an MMA match there here in Kansas. It was twenty I hit do with like twenty six or twenty seven knees. It was actually funny because after they had stopped the match, um, my coach was like, "Hey, is he responding? Is he waking up?" I said, "Fuck him," because if it was me, he would have did the same thing to me. So why could I ever advertise with anybody else when I'm in there to try to do my job? You know, if I could have killed him, I mean, that's what it would have went to. It's the rough job to stop him. It's not my job to stop him. I prepare right. to fight. Prepare to go as far as I need to go. I'm, I'm I'm prepared to go as far as I need to take it. And the ref's job is to stop it from going that far. So that's the mentality I go in there with, especially what I have to suffer from. So uh, with that mindset alone, I just it's almost like a switch, it's almost like another mode that I tap into because I think that pain just resonates so deep inside me. Like a pit bull, you're gonna attack, man. I can't wait. <laughs> you know, that's basically, I'm, yeah, I'm pumped that's up, good. Big Daddy. Cool. Man, I don't blame you. I can't one wait bit. to watch Cyborg maul this dude. Big Daddy yeah, so, Cool, you might need to make a trip out there, man, for this one. I tell you, maybe man, you I'd can fight be, after him. I'd love to be in that corner, man. You know, uh, man, I just I've uh, seen I'm Big so, Daddy Cool knock out quite a few people in his day, oh, Cyborg. Yeah, for yeah. sure. He would have made a great, great MMA if they would have had that. It, the funny thing is this, too. Uh, <laughs> AD, when uh, mixed martial arts uh, UFC first started, uh, me and Coach Taylor, we were watching it in high school, man, and uh, we we were all about it, man. We loved it. Tank we Abbott. remember uh, Tank Abbott, you know. He was he's, one of the guys. He was just a muscle. I'm a little winded right now because I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, – yeah. I would like to, if we could, man, go through uh, – let's run through your college run because you had a lot of stuff there. And then, like, we had that time period, A.D., where, you know, you had, you had gotten in some trouble and I somehow got in touch with you. And what that was about, man, you know, I'm one of those coaches where if you're one of my guys, you know, you're one of my – it's for life. You know what I mean? And, you know, I think it's important to know for everybody, like who's going to be there when the sun's not shining and what the times are down, you know what I mean? And, you know, coach Taylor's been there for me during some very dark times. And, uh, you know, I, I reached out to you and, uh, cause you were one of my guys and I wanted to see, see, see what we could do. And, uh, coach Taylor was, uh, coaching at VUU and at the time you know I I, I got his info your information and, and and talked to him about it but it, it was one of those type deals where uh we're so tight that I gave him you know the word and that that's all he needed you know what I mean like he knew that you were my guy and that was it man that was just kind of good enough answer you know you see it? It says Lakewood tight end. 
<laughs> still got it. Yeah. Still got you, man. See, so uh, you You're know, in Palomar. got it right some, there. Hey, so, some people, you know, never give up on people. You know what I mean? And as as as, as good good you know coaches and, and good you know, and that's the thing. All the guys that are watching this from Lakewood, if if you don't have my contact, man, it's easy to I'm I'm easy to find. You know what I mean? You can find me on Twitter. You find me on here. Uh, you know, check out Totem Pole Sports. You know, that's what we're here for. We're here to uh, make connections and make history. And this is history making right here. This is a history document. You know, uh, I'm super, super excited about it. But if you can, let's dive into, you know, the trials and tribulations of college. You going to a spot and not having a spot for you. Just dive into that for us. Uh, so um, I started off um, after Lakewood. I ended up going to uh, Morgan State. I uh, wasn't really too fond of being in there. Um, I love. I, I didn't really like how things were going. My living arrangements, um, being away from home. You know, um, I, right then and there when I was in, when I went away from home, I already had had a kid, so I was leaving my child and the mother of my kid behind to go. You know, pursue uh, my dream to be able to get a better life for me and my family. I just knew that they couldn't stop with me being a father, um, because now it just makes more sense for me to be able to have something to be able to give back and lead back. Um, because in those years, right, in and then and there, somebody needs to be able to have something to be able to lean on. And I was that last um, resort of being able to save whatever it is that I needed to save when it came to my family. Um, so I went to Morgan State, uh, went there, and I was there for a year. Uh, I tried to, I wanted to transfer because I really just didn't like the school. I didn't like the way I was living. I didn't really like the whole ordeal of it. You know, um, it just wasn't for me. Um, so, um, and then they did a lot of things where they took my money early on. And, uh, this is a lot of under the table stuff that I just didn't really uh, particularly like. And come to find out, I was out. They took a lot, thousands of dollars out of my scholarship and stuff like that just to find ways to have other players uh, have money and all this stuff and stuff like that, uh, which is, you know, something I just really like. So I ended up um, getting off the football team, spending the semester just, you know, find, trying to find myself and figure out where I could go to play football. I was going to go to Bethune, uh, but due to transfer rules, I had to sit out. And then Bethune didn't want to give me a scholarship and I was going to have to sit so um, I ended up finding a different way to get out uh, was going to go. Um, I actually found out when I couldn't go to Bethune, I tried to get back on the football team, but the coach was not having it. The new coach at the time, he was not having it. Uh, so he was trying to start a new era there. So I understand that point, um, especially since I had left. So I ended up transitioning all the way over to Arizona Western in Yuma, Arizona. Um, I went to Yuma, Arizona. Uh, my first year was kind of a it was kind of hard uh, to actually get adjusted uh, to actually playing out there. Um, it was kind of, I felt like a, Bambi with new legs, you know, um, mm -hmm. Mike overtaking me to the point where I had always had trouble remembering plays. But later on, when I come to find out it was just my anxiety, I have general anxiety disorder. And what would happen is I would be so anxious and try to think about so many things and the intrusive thoughts will overcome me. And what I would do is I would forget what was being told to me. So then when we forget, I would have more anxiety because now I need to remember and I would get in trouble for knowing that if I forget, this was going to happen. And I was in a constant cycle and I didn't never get to the bottom of that until four years later. So um, I, it, it messed me up. It messed up my position of being able to play football. Um, messed up my position to start. Um, it was just a whole nine yards of that. But when I, once I got to my first season, it was terrible. I, I bought all spring. I had a lot of high hopes for me to be able to get a lot of good looks at a lot of good schools that were coming into the JUCO because we had a lot of upcoming stars. You know, a lot of people, like I said before, they was their time to shine. You know, they had a good film. They had times where they was going to be able to start making it out and everything. And plus, we went to the uh, WSFL championship. So a lot of big schools were coming to our school to recruit these players who were part of this WSFL championship team in the league. Um, so what ended up happening was. Um, that spring, all that was going crazy. I was getting high looks, good looks from these different, uh, different people. You didn't really have much film, so it was almost like, hey, look, let's see what you're doing this up in the season. Plus, let's see what you're doing during the spring. I like how you're moving everything like that, but we need some concrete stuff on my spring and, 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 and equipment. So um, that's that, that summer, I was grinding out. You know, I was one of the leaders on the football team, leading everybody, doing workouts, staying on top of everybody. Kind of just one of those people that's the captain um, for spring. And just keep everybody in order and leading by example. Ball camp doing great, I'm doing everything, I'm, I'm stepping up, I'm everything like that. Uh, it's kind of like my breakout year to finally prove, like, hey, look, man, I told you I'm going to go to the league, this is my proof, this is me, I'm going to go D1, and I'm going to go ahead and put every, the world on notice. The last, what is it, the last, like, scrimmage before the game, before the game next week, uh, uh, a defensive lineman puts, pushes, uh, uh, a, a defensive lineman pushes uh, the, the defensive lineman pushes the whole line no into my yeah, well. It's LL. Oh, it's a, no, my knee. Spraying my ACL, spraying my ACL, had a bone bruise all the way up to my kneecap, all the way down to my shin. 
Um, and then I also ended up having uh, uh, fiber tears in my hamstring. So that put me out for the whole season with not having film. So I'm like, what am I going to do? So, you know, I'm crying every day. I'm on crutches. And then the coach got a nerve to be like, hey, man, you need to hurry up and get back on. You know, you don't let these young clubs take your short, um, take your position. I'm sitting there like, bro, I'm on crutches. What can I literally do right now? Wow. You know, so like lit a fire to me because I'm watching people that I felt like I was supposed to be in a position of. They get to the bottom of and like – I'm watching them take over where the position I'm supposed to be at, and then that person, you know, the tight end that was behind me that I was supposed to be playing in front of, he was balling out, everything like that. And I was yeah. so frustrated because I was like, that's supposed to be me. I'm not upset at him. And then that spring, LSU's coming for him. Bama's coming for him. Um, wow. for State, like all those big schools that I wanted to get that love from, they were all on him. So I'm watching, I'm like, wow, like, Bro, that could have been me taking these visits while I'm still healing up. So that spring, I'm trying to prove that I can do whatever I needed to do. And I'm supposed to graduate that spring. But he let me come back because I didn't have any kind of looks. They come to find out I couldn't play another football season. So he can't let me he let me come back I think that fall or something like that or that summer. So he let me come uh, or that spring. He let me come back that spring to participate in spring practices so I can at least get some looks and do some 7 on and, you know, just work my way out. And I was a good kid, had good honor roll student there and I was making no trouble. So he's like, y'all, I'll pay for you to come back. I'll pay for you to be here. So like that during springtime because you're a good kid and you make no trouble and you're trying to get your way out. So I see what you're doing. I'll go ahead and help y'all with that. So <laughs> I do that and the, the tight end that's there who's behind me, I'm watching him get all these big offers and stuff like that. In the next, the next year, he even blows up even more, top tight end in the nation. Wow. And uh, with the Arkansas and stuff like that, and uh, we ended up uh, being one of those guys um, to make it there. And I was just like, you know, where's my chance? Where's my time? And I was able to walk on at USF. So I ended up going to USF uh, because they yeah. came in. You know, uh, Rock, Rock, Ronnie Adams was there. My quest, my best was there. So they helped me put a good word in for, for there. So I ended up going there and I moved back to, to Florida and I was able to go to school there and I stayed with my quest, my best, with roommates. So he kind of helped me out with everything that was going on, stay with him. So I had to focus on what I needed to focus on. But what happened one night, tragedy was that it was one night I ended up, find, I was coming from a girl's house and I ended up finding a credit card, a credit card that was on the floor. And I was like, oh, I'll just return it out to the front office. But at that time, it was too late. The front office was closed. So I kept it the next day. We didn't have practice. So I'm in there. I'm paying for tickets, like $400 on a ticket. Mind you, I always got tickets. I always got tickets to Tampa. I hate Tampa. So I'm in Parking there. Parking is terrible. Parking is terrible so there. Yeah, so I go in there, I go in there, I, I pay for my tickets and stuff like that. Then the rest of the day I'm off. So I'm like, I'm finna go get you some food. And what I end up doing was I end up using the card to get my food. Come to find out the car was stolen. So when they reported the car stolen, the lady, she swiped my card. She's like, hold on, can I get that card again? She swiped it again. I'm like, sure, you need another card? She's like, no, I can not swipe it again. What pinged was this card is reported stolen if used, report to authorities. So she was like, okay, yeah. So then she's like, I'm going to use it on a register in the back. But she went in the back and called the police. And then that's when she ended up, I ended up, uh, the police ended up coming and asking why I did this. And I was like, well, I would use to get food. That's really what I used it for. And prior to that, I had just got in trouble from, from taking uh, grocery stuff from the from the grocery store out there. So I was down bad already. I got kicked out of public for not for, for taking grocery stuff out of there. So it, it was just a, 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 hey, you're going to get in, you're going to start doing something until you get caught. And now you can't, you can't do it no more. So they ended up taking me to jail. Um, they, I ended up getting bonded on and stuff like that. I got kicked on the football team. Mind you, I was in, I was good with the dean of public health, and I had a public, I was a public health major. They was going to help me get in touch with doing community service, helping out at hospitals, get involved with the community with Derek Brooks and all that stuff like that. Yeah. But then when I happened, the, the coach ended up telling her about, yeah, he's still trying to get, he's still trying, he he has two kids. He's supposed to be. Back home, but he's supposed to be doing this for his kids. He he doesn't have money for this. He wants to be focused on this, but he's he's out here still in doing stuff like that. And so the public health, the dean of the public health took that ass. I've been trying to help you do stuff in the community service and stuff like that, but this is what you've been doing outside of taking the, the credit card. You end up using it, but outside of that, you tell me that you need help with 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 uh, your family and all the other stuff, but you just been using me and stuff like that. And she sent me a long, lengthy paragraph. And she was like, yeah, I'm not helping you ever again. I, I can't believe that you put a bad taste in my mouth because what you did, you, you need to quit school and actually go home and take care of your kids and, and do that. I'm like, bro, like, what? Wow. I'm Wanted like, you to quit football. She said quit Wanted college. you to quit your dream, right? Wanted you to quit your dream, basically. Yeah, so when that happened, I was like, man, she's, by, she not, she's not behind me. And then, you know, I had to meet with head coach, Coach Strong, and he was kind of just like, 
done with you. I can't give yeah. you another chance. At the point in time, there was two other people that had big chart, big thing that was going on at USF. We had one kid who was who had allegedly uh, 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 sexually assaulted a couple of individuals. Then we had another kid who had just falls off a family home and then got shot, had shot at the family and got shot at, and he was in a hospital. So during that time, in the peak of that, I got in trouble again. So it was like, we got to make an example out of you, especially if we, and especially if you were convicted of this. I mean, there's no coming back from that. So with that being said, that's when I ended up having to find another way to go. My friend just got kicked out of Washington State. So we're us two knuckleheads. He said, hey, come with me. I'm going to go to Central Oklahoma. So boom, he that's comes right. down Washington, I end up getting um, getting in touch with trying to get with him. Um, we talking to the coach. The coach, I tell the coach about my sister. So he get up. So he get the lawyer and stuff situated. The attorney, I tell her about the situation. He's like, hey, look, we got two charges pending for for for, for petty theft and um, credit card fraud. So what I'm happening was, she said, I'll take care of it. I told her I can go to school to play football. There's no school that wants me. She said, go right ahead. So I called the coach. I tell him, hey, look, I'm coming. I'm on my way. I got to turn and take care of my case. Can I go up there? He's like, yeah, can I, can I drive? He said, yeah, bring Kyron with you. So me and Kyron were driving up there. I got a 2007 Chevy Cobalt. You know how small Chevy Cobalt is? I got all of my belongings, me and him. We're driving like this. Everything in my backseat of my trunk. We're driving like this. I got everything with me. I'm not, I can't see my kids. I got two kids. I can't see nothing. My kids. Um, I'm fighting this case. I can't go back home. We're broke. We have no money. There's no money for me to be in the state. I'm not in school. So I'm going, I got my last one. We're sharing cheeseburgers, cutting them in half. We're sharing 10 pieces, cutting down the middle. With all the money we have for gas and all that. We stay with his family in Atlanta with uh, Peter Ward's um, uh, family. And uh, he tells us, hey, I got an apartment for y'all. Um, everything, y'all going to stay in the apartments. We'll have uh, money and all. I got a job for y'all to have extra money on the side. We're going to pay y'all the max for what we can pay y'all. We go up there. The first day he's telling me, we don't got no money for you. Got no money for you. Got nothing for you, anything like that. I was like, man, I'm fighting the case. I can't see my kids. I can't call them. I can't go home to anything. My mom doesn't. My mom doesn't have money for me to stay there. My family is not. It's just poor. We're out. So what is? What can I end up getting myself into? That's going to help me get myself through what is going on. I just dropped. I just drove across the country in a Chevy yeah. Cobalt. My Chevy Cobalt is not making it back there at all. So he's like, I'm sorry, I don't know what to tell you, but I can send you to another school. I'm like, nah, bro. You have to take care of me. You have to do something. You have to figure out how I'm gonna play at this school. I'm uh, and then where I'm staying at. He's like, where are you gonna stay? I'm, I'm, I said, I'm gonna stay on your couch. I'm gonna sit in your. <laughs> I'm gonna eat in your fridge. Uh, <laughs> your pantry, yeah, yeah your pa pantry. So you got to fix this. So come to find out, we called the coach the next day. The coach didn't even know I was coming. He said, "Hey, we didn't throw the scholarship towards your way because we thought that you were still fighting the case." So I was uh, like, "Now tell me this, man. Tell me, was it a lawyer that they had got you, or you were able to get a lawyer because she was like an angel to you, right? She gave you." I still got her number. I, I called her last year. What a blessing. Uh, look, I also I saw that I need the dean of public health from USF. I need to talk to her. I don't know if she's still there or not, but I need to talk to her because yeah, I want her to know. Gotta find that out. Gotta find it out. But one of the players I got in trouble uh, 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 two years before, prior, he gave me her number, so I talked to her about it. Come to find out when I had left and everything like that, she took care of the whole case for me. Mind you, per charge is 1500 per charge, so I only ended up paying her $300 because that's all I had at the time. So she ended up with the thing, and then after the case was dismissed and I told her how good I was doing and school and everything like that, she was like, you found a school to be at? And they're paying you this max, and they're, letting you, they're getting, and they're letting you do all this stuff like that. She was like, I got your case dismissed. You don't have to worry about anything in Florida. And I, I waived the rest of your attorney fees. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. And I, and then I got my degree here in psychology. And I've been here ever since. And I played arena football here. And then I tried out uh, the MMA because, you know, to get in shape. And I ended up doing a smoker fight. And I beat the dude real bad in a smoker fight. And come to find out he's been fighting for four years. And I've only been doing it for a month and a half. And he was like, bro, stick with it. I told my coach about it. He's like, hey, look, you know you can fight for like 10 or 15 years and, and be one of the best at this with how you move and how agile you are. And how yeah. fight focus. And next thing you know, I was like, I've, I've been here ever since, especially with the love I've been getting. So it's crazy. I hey mean, you got, you got quite the story. And then, you know, I've, I've been around, uh, you know, college sports for a long time. And I've had uh, my fair share of incidents and things and friends I've seen that have had tough things bouncing around everywhere. I've had friends play in um, Europe. I've had friends play all across the country, arena football, still trying to make their dreams. And then guys get into the MMA. And I tell you, yeah. all the stuff that I ever did, MMA and jiu-jitsu was the best thing I ever did. It was the most calming, the most relaxing. Like, it, it is tough. It's one, it's one of the hardest things you can do, especially competing in it. But it, it really kind of mellows you out and focus you, focuses you and takes you away from all that stuff. And, 
You know, that's where I think, you know, because you've gone through, like you kind of talked about all the different things you've done is why you're so successful in this sport already. And honestly, just talking to you, I feel like you're going to be a lot more successful in the years to come. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting on uh, that Synergy FC and seeing you this weekend. And I just, I just hope, uh, I, I do want to see you knock a guy out in five seconds, but I hope we get a little bit more of a show. Yeah. AD, a, a uh, I, I just want to say this, man. You had to go through all of that stuff. You know, to uh, to do what you're doing right now, man. And you're doing the right thing. You're channeling all of that negative stuff, you know, in the right direction. And uh, I could not be more proud of you. Uh, you got a fan for life with me. And, uh, you know, if there's anything you ever need down the line, man, you let me know. I would love to go to a fight. I would love to, you know, host a watch party here. Or, you know, when you get a title or you get a couple titles, you know, when you come to Southside St. Petersburg, you're going to have to dial me up, um, you know. And, and I think when you are finished with your fighting, uh, there's something even bigger for you out there, too. It's definitely telling your story and giving, giving that stuff back because you give, you give people that want to quit a fighting chance, man. You came from the gutter and brother, you are living the American dream right now. And the most important thing I think out of this is you, you always believed in yourself and, oh, no. No doubt. you know, that is the most important thing that you can do, man. You always, always believe, you know, sometimes it's just about showing up like the guy you want to be like. You know, you keep training like the baddest man on the planet. I tell you what, good things are going to happen for you, man. Yeah. Well, no doubt. And I, and I firmly believe that. I think the biggest thing is that I think my burning desire just to want better for me and my family was just always the ultimate line and the silver lining of me understanding that that that's just, that trumps all. You know, I can't, I, I can't, I like, my thing was always like this. If I suffered this long and I've been through all this stuff for this long, why won't I sit here and dot, dot, like tap in or, 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 or really lock in for these certain amount of time to finally be able to stop suffering? And that was the thing, though. It, 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 it used to just trouble me. Like, like growing up, man, those rats were, man, I say those rats were so loud and so vicious. I'm talk, I, I got bit by a rat twice in my own house. And I remember walking to my mom, I got bit. She would just try, like, Oh my goodness! Like I, can, I can I couldn't leave here if I wanted to. I I, I see it in her face. Like, and then for now, for me to be able to have two houses, for me to move my mom from St. Pete all the way to Kansas, for her to put her in her own house, for her to live how she needs to live or how she wants to live. Come on, man! That's a that's a better feeling than all knowing that she ain't gotta never worry about a rat again. She ain't never gotta worry about a roach. She ain't never gotta worry about none of that stuff like that, you know, or having to be, be accustomed to. To, to, to those living arrangements ever. You know, I even, I, st I, I remember watching this video about rats in this household the other day and it made me, it, made, it, it took me back. It, it made me cheer up, you know, so it just made me understand that that pain still there. That's why people have to suffer. That's why I say like, I stuff, you know, I'm on this revenge tour because I didn't go through all that stuff for no reason, not for me to just have success and tell people my story. Somebody got to pay for it. Somebody got to pay for it. You know, so that's why I be saying, like, you know, I just wanted a little bit more than the other person that probably doesn't have it a little bit better than me. So that's why I got to hurt you because you, you, you probably ain't suffer enough. So you got to feel some of, some of this pain, some of it. And, my, and, my, and the best way for me to be able to put it out in a, in a, such a positive outlet is, is, is fighting. Not because I could just hurt somebody, something like that, but I just love doing it. I love how I put it together. I love being able to do it and showcase who I am and build my stuff from scratch. A lot of people don't even know what a cyborg is. You wouldn't even know what cyborg is if I didn't build a brand, if I didn't make this T-shirt, if I didn't... If if I didn't have this cup, you wouldn't know what a cyborg is. You wouldn't know what this is. It's something I built. I built from the ground up, you know, so it's just almost to the point where it's like I have enough faith in myself to understand. I know where I'm headed at and I know where I'm going. It's just another number of putting all those different variables together and being able to do those things so people can understand that, yeah, I'm different and I hope you take, take wind of it right now before it gets too big because you know, I just see myself being on Wheaties, your commercials, your billboards, and I see myself doing that, you know, kind of like The Rock. Kind of like how Shaq is. That's just like my ultimate great dream and goal, you know. You, man, you are, man. Coming up here soon, and that's 5-0 and oh this Saturday. Most you definitely. are a franchise, my man. You are a franchise. Uh, without a doubt, man, your kids will never live the life you did, and that's what a good man does. And, you know, bringing your mom over there, man, that's got to mean – 
you know, everything to you. And uh, yeah, man. Uh, it, Shout out to Paul Dance for making that happen, though. Our friends about there was making sure to help me make, uh, make sure that that happened, you know. So uh, that was something that I really needed, and uh, he was able to help make that happen. So I got my brother and my mom up here in their own house. Um, you know, they used to stay next door to me. So my friends brought some shout out to him who made that happen, man. It was it was definitely needed. Yeah, man. I want to give a couple shouts out to. I want to give a shout out to uh, you know Logan McNeil, his family, uh, Isaiah Wynn, Big Easy, uh, Anthony Huggabuck, Book, uh, you know Donovan Pink, you know uh, Quiz. Uh, yeah. Tray Trayvon, uh, definitely uh, Chris Granger, uh, my man Mac, Mitch, and Ricky Wilcox. You know, all those guys were guys that were there uh, when, yeah. when you know when, when that that kind of uh, you know my first year with those guys, and uh, they always mean a lot to me. And uh, yeah, man, anything else you want to uh, you want to plug or you want to end this with, man? This has been it's been fire, and uh, I look forward to us doing this. You know, let's all get together and think of a good time and, you know, let's chop it up and, you know, maybe maybe get to where we're doing MMA on here more often. That's cool with oh, you, man. I think you're a rock star, brother. Yeah, I'd definitely be open to doing that. Um, the only thing I really want to plug and play is understanding that we're in a point of time as right now, bro, man. I think it's very imperative that you do actually you, – you, you, you believe in what you pray for, but also protecting your peace. And I feel like protecting your peace is doing little things that make you happy and not – and not at the, the the not being a victim of somebody else's happiness, knowing that you want to be a puppet to make somebody else happy, um, and 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 also understanding that therapy is not for people that are weak. Understanding that crying is not for the weak. Understanding that you go to therapy and is really good for you. And understanding that that's why I don't want to be a therapist because I understand that people who are suffering and going through whatever they're going through, they are rather they are rather look, listen to somebody who's somebody of status than somebody who is in therapy because they feel like somebody who's getting paid to tell them what they need to be able to do is 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 a downfall. It's black. It's not looked at. It, it's it's frowned upon. So um, that's why I'd rather be a motivational speaker because I'm already credentialed to be a, you know, to be a therapist and all that stuff like that. But I also know what I'm talking about because I went to school for it. But um, yeah, man, I just advocate for mental health and push it for that because I do still suffer from mental health and different uh, disorders and everything. I take medicine, I take trazodone, Lexapro, um, but outside of mental health, what I want to be able to do is let people know that I have a clothing line merch uh, right now. You guys can go ahead and check it out. Um, it's on millions.co. You know, type in AD the cyborg Palmer. I have my own clothing line right now. You guys can go ahead and get your own merch and um, and stuff like that. Um, should be able to send that link over and put that you know, down here. Um, and um, yeah, I'm coming up. I'm up and coming in the Wichita area, Wichita, Kansas. Um, and um, yeah, I'm just doing what I need to be able to do to get my name out there to be able to show people to put them on notice. And I'm coming for everything that I feel like I deserve. So, uh, shout out to my family. Um, also, shout out to, to Lex, my girlfriend, my backbone, the person that helps me get through what I need to get through and gets me going and has make sure that the, the, the empire is still up and going. Um, I, I really wouldn't be able to do anything without a, a, a strong queen uh, behind me. So I'm very happy for, for her helping, helping me get through what I'm going through. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> I think that's pretty much it uh, when it comes down to it. Well, Cyborg, I want to tell you, man, it's been great talking with you, dude. You already got a, a, an amazing story, and I do not think that it's over. I think you still got a lot ahead of you uh, in the MMA world and also all the stuff you talked about. You know, mental health is a huge thing right now. It's, you know, I'm a teacher, and I see it pretty much every single day, what these kids are going through. Um, and that's only just what I see from the surface. You know, I don't know what they're going on in their home life at home. And uh, I think it's incredibly important to see guys that have gone through such things that they can, you know, relate and say, well, look, I was here in this position. Now look what I'm doing. Like you said, you got your family out there with you. You're getting ready to be five and oh, I know you're going to have another knockout. I just can, I can already feel it. Know what's going to happen. Um, you know, man, like I said, you just got a lot ahead of you and I think it's going to be awesome to, to keep uh, in touch with you and get you back on here after your fight. And, um, you know, as we get to you know, your 10 fight mark and all that different stuff where we're just going to keep seeing you grow and grow and grow. And like you said, you're, you're going to be on top of the world before too long. Yeah, and, and that's, that's why I'm looking to take it. But, you know, being able to see those ups and downs early on in the journey of before I felt like I was never going to, like, let's just say, you know, in those times where I've seen other people make it, when I felt like it was my time, it just was one of those seasons where it wasn't my winning season. You know, witnessing that made me put things in respect of how to, how to understand what to do when it was going to be my winning season. So now when I'm in a situation where I can sit back and see that those people who have, who I thought were in winning seasons, they're already on the decline. They're, that was their height. There was that was their peak of not saying their life, but it was the peak of what I felt like their success was. Because after they went to their college and they played football, there was nothing after that, you know. So then it goes to show, like you know, maybe I'm gonna have my winning season, and maybe I could just 
pray for it to be a long one so I can be able to reap the benefits of everything and get everything out of it because I felt like it was just, this is what I've been wanting my whole entire life, you know? So when that understanding enough was made me push forward and just made me understand that, yeah, I got to make all this stuff count now because it, it may not be no second chance and I just got to make them feel me. It's just almost like having to, I, got, I just got my, the chip on my shoulder so big. So I, I couldn't help but go ahead and eat up, you know? Yeah, well, well said. Well, we'll be watching you on uh, SynergyFC.com this weekend, Saturday night, and uh, definitely be rooting for you, man. I, I just know you got it in you. Like you said, you already went through all of the different stuff you're doing to, to be ready. Um, I don't think you can do anything else except for getting that that cage and just knock somebody's head off, man. Well, definitely, definitely going to go out there and put on the show. Um, if you guys want, you guys can follow me on Twitter, The Real Cyborg, not hard to find. Um, and that's cyborg spelled P-S-Y-B-O-R-G. Um, you can find me on Twitter, you can find me on IG, even on TikTok, the real cyborg MMA, um, even on Facebook. Um, I gotta find a way to be able to start uh, getting my link out uh, to my clothing line and stuff like that. I'm part of this profile called means.co where you can guys can go and buy uh, my merch, but also you can buy personalized videos and you can, I can stream off of there. So I won't be able to stream this fight, but upcoming events I'll be able to stream and stuff like that. So uh, just a matter of uh, trying to figure out different innovative ways to build my brand and understand that the cyborg isn't a fighter or a nickname. It's actually a brand, uh, you know. So, uh, yeah, just pushing that narrative to understand that, you know, this is a little bit more serious with things that I got going on. So. Now, certainly. Well, well Tony Pole Nation, definitely check out the real cyborg, P-S-Y-B-O-R-G. Check out the clothing line. Check out Synergy FC. See an awesome knockout coming up this weekend. And uh, right. Coach K, I'll let you get the last word in. Um, you know, since you brought cyborg on today. Yeah, man. Uh, Dana White, man, we coming for you, buddy. We coming sure. for you, man. We got a powerhouse right here. And, uh, sure. you know, I, I, I'm so proud of you. Uh, you know, th this this process is not easy. You know, it's it's a uh, it's doing all the little things and all the tricks consistently over time, over long time. That's where life changing events occur. There's not one thing that's going to make you a cyborg. It's 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 unlimited things, you know, and uh, yeah, just I couldn't be more proud and excited for you. And uh, everybody go watch this fight. Go get this guy's tennis shoes. Go get his T-shirts, get his hats, get his merch. This guy's nothing but the truth, man. This guy's a modern day hero right here, man. This guy is living his dream and he's fighting for everything he's ever had. And he's getting what he deserves. And I'm super proud of him. Hey, Coach, you want to uh, give a shout out to uh, to our sponsor, if you could send Certainly. us off. So, yeah, we've got uh, Cultivate Wellness. They've been helping us out big time. They helped me and my family, too. Um, CBD, neuroprotectin. I know you got your CBD uh, sideboard, but, you know, it's all good quality stuff. Definitely check it out. Cultivate Wellness. Cultivate with a K. Give them a call. Um, if there's anything that you can get from them, they are incredible people to talk to you through everything. So give them a call, 804-464-2238. But um, Cyborg, man, great talking with you. I hope we get to talk again here in the future. I'll be rooting for you again this Saturday. And uh, Tony Pole Nation, check him out. Check out all his stuff. And uh, we're going to see see you grow, man. I want to see uh, once you get in the double digits, I think you're still going to be uh, easily on the plus side. Looking forward to, you know, getting UFC, getting into Bellator, getting into one of those big organizations. Because just from seeing, the you know, uh, Coach K sent me two of those knockouts. Like, holy smokes, man. Like, you got some power. And. I think it's going to be something that anybody getting in the cage with you is going to be thinking about big time when they get in there. No doubt, no doubt. So, man, uh, thank right. you, AD, man. Thank you for the opportunity, buddy. Coach Hutch, man, you're the man. Appreciate you all you guys. Good, yes, so, sir. Cyborg, great talking with you, man, and you, you best of luck and rest up. And, uh, man, we'll be watching you Saturday night. Most definitely. Appreciate you guys. Appreciate uh, thanks you guys. again. Take care. All right. Peace.